Okay, this video is chapter 15 from the book Medical Reformation by me. Um, we're going to be talking about iron, free iron. Why is free iron so dangerous? Um, this is something most people don't know about. A lot of people heard of anemia, but anemia is relatively uncommon, whereas iron overload is super common. Most men, after 25 years of age, are iron overloaded. Most women uh, quickly become iron overloaded once they're postmenopause. They stop uh, menstruating. And the key point is iron you know, typically cycles back and forth between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. It's a transitional metal, meaning it has a variable valence. And so it can go back and forth between Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus, and hand off electrons to oxygen and generate reactive oxygen species. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but the gist out of it is right here summarized in this quote by Eugene Weinberg. He said, iron inside the body is like fire inside a house. The fire is good when it's in the fireplace. It's good when it's in the stove, but it's bad everywhere else. And that's the same thing with iron. So the reason why iron is so common in, in the human body is because by being able to have a variable valence, and, it, and that's because it's a transitional metal, has a variable valence, it can hand off electrons in the middle of enzyme active sites. So it's very useful like in the cytochrome enzymes. An electron transporter plays a role. It's also useful with hemoglobin, having reversible ability to let go of oxygen or to bind to oxygen. So it can have very useful properties for us, but you don't want it randomly stealing and, and donating electrons where it shouldn't be. So the body is very careful about keeping iron where it belongs. This is a nice metabolism diagram. We ingest food that contains iron, and then it's absorbed primarily in the duodenum, proximal part of the small bowel, and then it gets taken up on these transferrin. You can think of them as like a little canoe or a wheelbarrow um, to transport you know, two molecules of iron around in the blood. A lot of the iron will go to the bone marrow, so it can be incorporated, for example, into hemoglobin for carrying oxygen in the red blood cells. That's a, a large amount of the iron that we get. Uh, we store some iron in the body, too. And I think that's because in case, you know, our ancestors, you know, had sudden significant massive bleeding, they could replenish their hemoglobin relatively quickly, an adequate amount of it in that fashion. Um, this NTBI is non-transferrin bound iron so that would be free iron and that's the dangerous stuff the bad stuff we also store a lot of iron in our cells especially in the liver we have a molecule over there called uh, ferritin which is kind of like a buckminster fuller geodesic dome or you know, a buckyball if you will and that can hold like about 4,500 iron molecules which is quite a lot um, iron gets recycled through the spleen because red blood cells typically live about three months 120 days then the spleen's like the graveyard for red blood cells and the macrophages, reticular endothelial cells, they ingest the iron and it kind of gets cycled back to where it should be. Um, when the body has a problem, like let's say you have an acute infection and the body doesn't want any bacteria to grow in your blood. This is a real important point I'm about to say. Bacteria need iron to grow. That's a super important point. Bacteria need iron to grow. So the body is, is real intelligent. It'll just shut down iron absorption to prevent any extra iron getting into the blood as one of the ways to slow down bacterial growth. It was harder for our ancestors to find iron. Um, you're going to come to the conclusion once you've studied iron, you want to reduce your exposure to it. And the ways you reduce exposure to it is just don't eat meat, okay? especially red meat's going to have a lot of iron in it. And you got to watch out. Nowadays, they iron fortify a lot of foods, which is really a toxic, bad thing to do. They should not have done it, but they're there. So uh, you want to, I would never eat anything that's iron fortified. You don't want that extra iron. When I was young, I didn't know any better. And I thought iron makes you strong like Popeye. And I used to intentionally eat all the raisin bran cereals because they tended to have added iron. You know, I didn't, was ignorant. I didn't know any better. I would never do that now. You don't want to cook on um, iron cookware. Um, you don't want to um, have iron in your water. So you can have a filter. Well, I specifically have an iron filter at my house is one of my water filter things. Um, the Bantus used to have problems from using iron cookware. So here's a nice picture showing you what's going on with iron with regard to infections. Imagine, you know, imagine you were gonna walk through the desert. Okay, and you had to walk 100 miles with no food or water. You couldn't do it because 
you need water. So a human can't walk a long distance in the desert without water or you die. Okay, there's the hot sun. And the point is in an egg, this is I'm going to get to how this relates to human blood in just a moment. In an egg, the yolk is where the embryo grows. And the egg white is mostly protein with no iron. So bacteria can get through the eggshell, but they can't get to the egg yolk because they can't travel through the egg white with its lack of iron. So human bodies do essentially the same thing. We sequester iron. We don't want any free iron floating around in our blood because we do have dormant bacteria. And by the way, dormant bacteria is an important topic and it's pretty obvious, but you will get funny looks from doctors, you'll get funny looks even from fellowship trained infectious disease doctors. Because what happens to doctors is they have certain textbooks that are the standards for their field. And the textbook is a big deal because they practice based on it and they take their board's exam based on it. So basically the way a typical doctor thinks is if it's in their standard textbook, it's real. If it's not, then it's bogus. Okay. But the joke is that their standard textbooks are totally out of date. They're wrong on really common basic stuff and they're designed to get them to sell more drugs. Okay. So what I'm trying to tell you is don't be surprised when you talk to doctors, they don't at first know this, but you know, you just have a little conversation with them. It's obvious. Okay. Everybody knows that there's bacteria and viruses that have dormant phases. Everybody knows tuberculosis can have a dormant phase. Uh, everybody knows that tertiary syphilis can have a dormant phase, that um, Lyme disease can have a dormant phase, okay? That some viral infections like herpes virus can have intermittent reactivations and stuff. So it has a dormant phase, okay? I even think the virus can sense when cortisol levels are high, you know, the person's stressed out and sleep deprived, and it's more likely to occur at those times. Okay, and then there's other bacteria that can live intercellular. And then once you start learning about it, you see there's other types of uh, dormant bacteria. It's pretty obvious, all right? So the point is that when you have high free iron in the blood, some of these dormant bacteria can be reactivated. And once they're reactivated, they could start causing problems. Like gram-negative bacteria have an endotoxin called uh, lipopolysaccharide, LPS. Gram-positive bacteria have an endotoxin called LT. A, lipotychoic acid, and when they're reactivated, they'll sometimes release these endotoxins and those will have secondary effects. The one I most commonly think about is the one that they can cause hypercoagulability, uh, like amyloid type clotting. I just released a video, it's a rerun yesterday, about amyloid type clotting. Douglas Kell from England, PhD, and Estheresia Pretoris, she's the lady PhD from South Africa, the ones who did the most work on that. That's an important concept to, to understand because that plays a major role in um, viral related clotting. A lot of people are interested in increased hypercoagulability related to viruses. And what I'm telling you is, if you want to get a basic understanding of it, you can watch my video that I just released yesterday, which would be April um, 14, today's April 15, 2024. And you'll understand that. You could also watch a lecture by Douglas Kell. Uh, he has a couple of really good long lectures. Sometimes he lectures with her, a lot of times not. Uh, she has lectures that kind of a lot of times go through the details, fill in the gaps. But anyways, his big long lecture on that subject like of amyloid type clotting in the context of viruses, it's highly valuable if you want to understand that, okay? Because I think those small viral amyloidogenic clots, you know, they can block up vessels in the brain, lead to brain fog. They can block up vessels in the heart, uh, potentially lead to fatigue. It's a useful concept to know what makes things hypercoagulable. And that's one of them. We talked about bridging molecules that overcome the zeta potential. Um, there is the story on amyloidogenic clotting related to leaky gut, related to viral infections. Okay, um, In the context of bacterial infections, we talked about overcoming the zeta potential, for example, with IgM antibodies. Okay, So anyways, this idea of avoiding free iron because you can reactivate um, bacteria is a big deal. And you also... Um, just sequester it all around so they can never get started, okay? Because they can't get through the egg white because there's no iron in it for them. Okay, um, so here's a little bit of how iron overload works. Um, up until about 20 years of age, men are growing pretty rapidly and they sort of use up their bodily iron relatively well, okay? But after that, they tend to stop growing and then they just start accumulating iron they become iron overloaded quite a bit okay women like i said they don't tend to become iron overloaded until they're post menopause
because they're menstruating. Menstruation really protects women in a lot of ways. We talked about that before, how it lowers their hematocrit, it keeps the red blood cells more flexible. Oh, but the problem is if a woman has a hysterectomy, especially before the age of 35, they can get lots of health problems because they're not as aware as men are of all these atherosclerosis risk factors and related problems, and they often will keep eating junk food and become quite hypertensive. We can lose a little bit of iron in our sweat, but not much. Um, so women lose iron by menstruating, and um, when she gets a hysterectomy, though, she becomes like a man in terms of her iron physiology. Okay, so here's a picture of you know where iron's located. This is the heme of a hemoglobin molecule. Iron's right in the center of hemoglobin, and it can bind reversibly to oxygen, O2, right here. Okay. Magnesium, the stuff you want to eat, is right in the center of chlorophyll. So hemoglobin, which comes from meat, uh, contains iron in the center, something bad you want to avoid. You know, if you're iron deficient, yeah, maybe you want to eat a little more. But most people are iron overloaded in the United States, the vast majority, okay? Um, they care about their health. Okay, magnesium is right in the center of chlorophyll. So you eat the plants, you get the good thing. This tends to be the, the basic way it goes with plants. Plants are always providing good things. More magnesium, more potassium, more dietary fiber, more antioxidants. They're alkaline, okay? Meats like everything bad. More iron, uh, more fat, uh, more animal protein, less antioxidants, etc. okay? All right, here's now a little bit about ferrous redox cycling. This is a really important point. It's pretty simple. You know, what you always need to get with these points is just the idea of what happens. And so, because really the key thing when you're learning about health in a meaningful way is what causes what to happen. And so basically, when you have free iron, it starts to cycle back and forth between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. This is called ferrous redox cycling. So that's important. And it's not really so much a substrate for a reaction. It's like a catalyst. And it can become autocatalytic, meaning it can really speed up these reactions and keep on going back and forth and generating a lot of these free radicals. This is called the Fenton reaction. And the easy way to remember it is Fe for iron and Fe for, um, I think ferrous is like the Latin word for rust. And that's where it comes from, ferrous for iron. And so it's abbreviated. Fe is the chemical symbol for iron. So Fe for iron and Fe for Fenton reaction. So the Fenton reaction will generate from hydrogen peroxide, it'll generate these hydroxyl radicals. And the hydroxyl radicals can be quite toxic. They can initiate lipid peroxidation chain reactions that will damage membranes. They can also damage DNA. Um, they can damage, you know, like I said, lipids. They can damage the inner mitochondria. Remember, they can cause all kinds of problems. So um, Douglas Kell, that uh, scientist I was talking about earlier, he wrote a great scientific paper called Iron Behaving Badly. And he goes through all this stuff. And it's brilliant. The guy's brilliant. He's a genius. He's kind of fat, though. I thought that was kind of funny. So you often see that in a PhD. The guy's an absolute brilliant genius on all this other stuff, but you know he doesn't know basics of nutrition. That's real common that a PhD will be great at one thing, but they don't have their overall act together on their health. Um, let's see here. All right, so now we'll talk about uh, iron overload in the context of mitochondria. So you can have iron overload with uh, free iron in the mitochondria sitting around right there, and that's bad because you're going to be generating a lot of hydrogen peroxide from your, you know, even under the optimal conditions, you have a little bit of electron leak from the middle of the inner mitochondrial membrane electron transport chain. And, you know, when you leak an electron off, let's say, coenzyme Q, it binds to oxygen, creates a superoxide. You got superoxide just mutase, which you know starts the ball rolling to neutralize it and makes hydrogen peroxide. But if you got a lot of free iron around, some of that hydrogen peroxide can be made into uh, hydroxyl radicals and damage the inner mitochondrial membrane. So that's why you just don't want high iron around. Okay, I'm gonna talk about how to get iron down in your system and what your target goal should be. Okay, ROS just means reactive oxygen species. You're gonna hear that word a lot. Uh, free iron just means that it's not bound to um, transferrin, you know, in the blood, or it's not bound to ferritin inside of cells. Um, there's also something called ferroptosis, whereby free iron um, can lead to 
uh, cell damage and cell death. So we're, we're not going to get too much into ferroptosis, uh, but just be aware it exists. This is enough for now. Oh, that's all I got on iron. Gosh, I thought I had more on iron. All right, so let me, I probably discuss it more in a different chapter. So let me just say a few more things about iron that I think are good for you to know. The bottom line is how do you get iron down and what do you want it to be? Uh, you want it to be, I like to keep it below, I want to get mine below 80. Ideally, I'd probably like to be between 30 to 80. And I, I have a whole bunch of lectures on iron. I've got a couple hours worth of lectures on iron, all right? So, and there's some really good books on iron, you know, like the one by Laufer is the best one to start with, Igor Laufer. Okay, um, so basically what do I do? I did try donating blood once to get my iron levels down because my iron level when I first checked it was 240, and that was a couple years ago. Um, and I was kind of surprised by that. That's in the normal range, but it's not. It's in the normal range if you go to a hospital and they print out a normal range for you. But the, the printed out hospital range is to be normalized based on a bunch of fat sick Americans. So I don't really care that much about normal values for Americans. Okay. The experts, I think the guy's name is a Larsky Polish guy. You know, show that you really want to keep your serum ferritin, you know, in the ballpark between about 30 to 80. So I first donated, you know, some blood, sort of the smallest amount they let me donate, but I didn't like it. I did it in a hurry on the spur of a moment, and I got lightheaded afterwards. I had to lay down. I really didn't like that at all. It wasn't a pleasant experience. If I could do it over again, I'd be very well hydrated before I went in there, make sure I have nothing else to do that day so it's easy for me to lay around if I need to. If you're going to donate blood, even have a driver. I would donate the smallest possible amount the first time around, and you can donate more than if you, once you're well hydrated or you feel good or whatever. Um, but you know, what I do now is whenever I have to get a blood test and I'll sometimes go for a blood test, you know, check my cholesterol, check my, uh, my vitamin B12 level, check my serum ferritin, whatever I'm doing. And whenever I do that and they take blood off me, I will have them just discard like about five small tubes, just throw them in the garbage or something. Because why they're, why they're doing that is they're getting my serum ferritin down. Last time I checked, I think it was around 114, uh, down from 240. So... You know, I'd like to, I'm working towards getting it below 80. And it's something you could do fast as a way to reduce oxidative stress so you don't have any of this ferrous redox cycling. And also keeping your liver healthy is important because your liver stores a lot of iron. So if you get liver damage, those dead liver cells will release iron into the blood because it'll come off of the ferritin. Um, that's a key thing. I can also tell you a real famous guy, Gregory Sloop, you know, the pioneer genius of atherothrombosis theory and atherosclerosis research. That's a big part of how he manages his atherosclerosis is he um, donates blood a couple times a year. And like I said, I, I was joking with him. I teased him. I go, because if you're donating blood a lot, these pretty big needle to, to donate blood. Every time you stick a big needle in the arm, you get some scarring. You often clot off the veins. So I said, you're going to end up looking like a heroin addict, you know, trash all your arm veins. Nobody will be able to start an IV on you. Everyone's going to think you're a drug addict. So I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but that's one thing you could do. And then just simply, once you know the game, don't eat anything that's high in iron. Okay, that's pretty easy to do. You can sweat off a little bit, so it's good to exercise, but it'd be hard to control your iron just by sweating. Um, so I think that's uh, the key stuff on iron. And if you're interested, I have longer lectures. I had a pretty good, I think, lecture about iron at Chef AJ, where I combined a whole bunch of shorter lectures on my own YouTube channel. I have a bunch of shorter lectures. Also, if anybody, you know, if you enjoy this content, and you think this is helpful, you know, please go, please go to Amazon and write a review. You know, whatever you think is the truth. If you think it's good, say it's good. If you think it stinks, say it stinks. Whatever, but um, it shows that someone at least is aware the book exists. Uh, so, anyways, hope that was helpful.